how do we ensure that technological breakthroughs, like the ones we create at MIT, truly lead to a better world? I'm Agustin Rayo. I'm a professor of philosophy, and I'm MIT's Dean of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences. Our theme today is ensuring access to a better world. We'll discuss how we can make sure that equity, democracy, human health is helped rather than hindered by new technologies. We'll think about what happens if technology is implemented in an unjust way, or if its benefits go to the highest echelons of society and leave others behind. Technology, at the end of the day, is a human practice. It can't be separated from society. And that is something we take very seriously at MIT. Our moderator today will be Asu Azdaglar, who heads the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science and is Deputy Dean of the Schwarzman College of computing. We're going to hear from Marzie Gozemi from the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science and the Institute for Medical Engineering and Science. We're going to hear from Alexander Mandre, also from the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. We'll hear from Caesar McDowell from the Department of Urban Studies and Planning. And we'll hear from Charles Stewart from the Political Science Department. Asu, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all this afternoon uh, and talk about a very good uh, topic, uh, ensuring access to a better world for everyone. And I'm very delighted uh, to have a great group of people uh, to be discussing uh, different aspects of this uh, topic. Um, just to start off, give a little bit of context uh, to build up on Augustine's amazing uh, introduction. We're all experiencing a transformation uh, with digital technologies and now increasingly AI uh, completely becoming a part of our social fabric, permeating every aspect of our lives. And as these technologies continue to be deployed uh, across almost all kinds of human activity, they are likely to have myriad, myriad effects on our ways of life, on our social norms, on all of our aspirations. And some good, uh, some perhaps unintended uh, and bad, and some could also be ugly. So the potential of these technologies are great, uh, and many people focus on them. We have the corpus of human knowledge at the uh, fingertips, at our fingertips. We can communicate effortlessly Cheaply, cheaply across the globe, and myriad production technologies have been possible because of innovations in software and hardware uh, you know, technologies. But we're also seeing, I think, more and more that these technologies may have detrimental effects on inequality, uh, on social anxieties, as well as on our democracy, just to name a few. There's growing evidence uh, that the rollout of software technologies have created new and much larger inequalities than what Western societies uh, used to have. While some entrepreneurs and managers and workers with specialized skills have seen their incomes skyrocketed, median wages in the US uh, have stagnated for almost four decades, and wage inequality has soared. Worse, Workers with high school education or less have experienced declines uh, in their earnings. There's also growing evidence that social media, which is, I guess, a very integral part of all of our lives, has adverse effects on the mental health uh, of many users. And even though many Americans are almost constantly connected to their friends, in quotes, uh, on Facebook or other platforms, they're feeling increasingly alone. And as ominously, digital technologies, which were just had this great promise uh, as a democratizing technology in the 2000s, has had the opposite effect. Um, there's a huge amount of misinformation uh, on social media. They spread uh, virally um, in filter bubbles that these platforms create in order to increase engagement uh, and advertisement revenue. 
And uh, digital tools are unfortunately also used by some authoritarian regimes to silence dissent and sometimes even repress their populations. So when you see all this good and the bad, I don't mean to sound very negative, but I think it's good to sort of be aware of uh, all the promise as well as you know, all the uh, risks that sort of these technologies bring. Uh, it's difficult not to ask whether we could design them differently uh, so that we get more of the good and less of the bad. And I think as Augustine mentioned, this is something we care very greatly here at MIT. So that, this is what our illustrious panel uh, here uh, will explore today. Uh, and we have a lot to discuss, but before I uh, jump in, I'd like to remind everyone that we would like to very much welcome the audience uh, into our conversation. So uh, uh, we will have a Q&A session at the end of our conversation. If you have any questions, uh, you can use the URL that you see on the screen to enter your questions uh, 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 online, and I will pull them uh, at the end of the uh, uh, conversation in the Q&A session. Please also feel free to just uh, you know, raise your hand and ask questions if that's something you prefer. So. With that, I'll maybe uh, quickly dive in. And I'd like to start by asking whether there's a broad agreement on what are the good and the bad we're getting from digital technologies and AI. And uh, we see there are optimists. We read about this all the time, as well as pessimists who put a different spin uh, on what we are seeing. Could it be that we're exaggerating maybe either good or the bad? And relatedly, what are the greatest risks from those technologies? And actually, are there risks that we should be paying more attention to? I'll start maybe with Charles. Thanks, Azu. Um, so um, my area of, of expertise is, is uh, American politics and American elections. And I got involved in this area right after the 2000 election for obvious reasons, and, and Bush v. Gore. In fact, MIT got in heavily um, because you know that the problems in Florida in 2000 were a um, really a, a, a cautionary tale about technology breaking down and um, disserving, um, disserving society. Um, and that's so. This issue in, in the area of elections has been something we've been thinking about for 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 quite a, for quite a while. Um, I think it's important for us to start on the positive side and to note that um, American democracy, as we understand it and as we practice it, really is unachievable except through the wise and good application of digital technologies, certainly. And we've been using digital technologies and automation of, well, actually automation of various sorts going back into the late 19th century. But certainly over the last 20 years, we've been doing things um, in America, which we don't even think about, where we have to use digital technologies, just registering people. We don't have to check in with the police every time we move. Um, and so we have to register and get people registered to vote. Um, we vote on a myriad of things. A um, citizen living in um, San Francisco will vote on more things in a presidential election than a resident of London will vote for in a lifetime. And just to manage that, to count those votes accurately and quickly, requires digital technologies. And so those technologies need to work for basic access and basic functioning of democracy. Now, we can imagine, we saw in 2000, and we see from time to time, how the failure to invest in those infrastructures can deserve um, um, American democracy. I'll end with this, though. I think that it's the, so recently we've seen, you know, there, there's a lot of craziness going on in American politics right now. And part of that craziness is actually attacking the use of of those technologies, um, calling for a return not only to hand-marked paper ballots, but hand-counted paper ballots, and other things that actually would, in many ways, make it impossible, almost impossible for many people to ha have their voices heard. But the greater challenge, I I'd say, that, that we're dealing with right now is this rise of digital, um, I'm rather, of social media. Um, which heavily requires on requires um, reliance on artificial intelligence, and both I would say forces of good and forces of evil um, are trying to use those tools, and um, and that's I think true in any any moment in American politics. But I think that many of the problems that we're dealing with right now is in elections is really how do we balance the use of the tools for people who would say want to under undercut democracy and those who would try to use them in order to reach out to underserved populations, to find out those underserved populations and engage them um, in the electoral process. Great. 
Nigel? So, yeah, I just wanted to add to, uh, to this a little bit more of a meta comment about the technology. So actually you mentioned as to both digital uh, technology and AI in particular, and I think actually it's good to kind of a little bit distinguish between them. So digital technology, think email, internet, and so on. It's something that are really mature technologies by now, which are essentially a fabric of our society. Like I don't think we can really imagine. I, like I still remember the pre-internet times vaguely, but like it's a different world. So this is already here, does not mean that we dealt with all the bad consequences of that. I think some of them we only now realize because this is the kind of the timeline, even though the technology is frozen, like the email works the same way for decades now. And even the same is true about websites and, and internet. Only now we are kind of finally like, well, we didn't really fully understand, but start to understand the societal aspects of this and how to modulate them. Now, the AI is a very different thing because AI is something that is only really developing now. So much of this conversation is you know, more about or what could have happened as opposed to what's happening. Although we sometimes we you know, jump the gun and we just put things in healthcare, put things for social justice, uh, injustice, and uh, uh, put things in social media. And then, well, bad things happen because we don't even understand the technology, let alone its societal impact. So essentially like thinking through, in particular, unintended consequences. So consequences that just happen from us playing with something new and not paying attention, you know, that's, that's a big part of what should be on our mind. And now whether you should be an optimist or a pessimist, I think neither. You should really be, have a clarity of thought, how you think about technologies and really think about the, all the stakeholders and essentially the broader implication of what this technology is doing. Excellent. you do it? I, I think an important thing also to focus on when we're thinking about AI specifically is uh, AI is built on data, as you may have famously heard, right? It's the, the fuel that it runs on. And when you think about what AI is learning, you have to think about the data that it's learning on. And so you have to think very carefully. People always uh, ask me, are you afraid of an AI that you train in the healthcare space, which is my area, killing patients. I said, well, it'll only learn to do that if the doctors do that. Mm -hmm. But doctors do occasionally, right? So uh, when human systems or human processes that we gather data from make mistakes or have biases or have systemic flaws or injustices, those data are being learned on by these AI systems. And we're just at the cusp now of being able to realize that we need to tell AI do what I say, not what you see me do, which is hard with children and even harder with AI. <laughs> <laughs> this is awesome. So very, very true. And I, I, I think the only thing I want to add to it, just kind of picking up what, what you just said, is that we know of all of these inequalities that exist in the world. And so the data that we have really is a representation of those inequalities in such different ways. Uh, and we don't have any systems to kind of really check that. And I think one of the reasons so, so many people are afraid of the technology or stepping into it mindlessly is they don't, there's, there's no alternative. There's no alternative path to say, how do I, as someone who's you know, a poor mother living in a particular community, understand this data I'm being asked to give hmm. and where it's going to end up? I have no way into that world. And I think we owe right, the public some visibility into that world and some way of actually having something to say about it. Very nice. So I really liked also, I think it was a theme in all your remarks, this distinction between digital technologies and now this uh, AI era. Excuse and so I'd like to ask a related question, sort of, I guess, in this new era, what's the vision of a better world? And Alexander, you mentioned uh, multiple stakeholders, uh, uh, Caesar, you, you yourself as well. So how should we think about this in the context of these many stakeholders? Uh, uh, does it involve you know, more transparency into th digital technologies? Are there some different paradigms on how these digital technologies should be used across everyone, uh, all populations? Uh, and what are some ideas that we should be paying attention to? Yeah, I can. Yeah, Go ahead. let me jump in and say a few things about that, uh, kind of based on the, our work at the Center on, on Constructive Communication here that we're trying to look at. And I, in my, the world that I uh, inhabit and I work in, I try to very much say, like, look, I know a little bit, you know, in the world, and I know a lot about this little bitty thing that we're studying, and I'm not going to make, you know, extrapolate to a lot of other things. So one of the things we're really interested in is what's actually happening in people's ability to feel like they live in community with each other. Right? How do we do that? And what can technology play in that? Of course, in order to understand that, you have to have some notion, what do you mean by community? 
And so we use this little kind of notion in our department that says like, you know, community exists in those places where people are interdependent and are able to peacefully struggle with traditions that bind them, interests that separate them, to realize a future that's an equitable improvement in the past. So for us, the technology that we need to be developing is things that allow us to be in those spaces of struggle peacefully, right? And right now, a lot of our social media technology is really performative, right? It pushes people in these spaces about what they're doing and talking mm -hmm. to each other is performing, right? And uh, what we need more of is actually technology that's supporting what we call kind of dialogue, right? What is it like to have a social dialogue platform? That's one of the things that we're, you know, we're looking at and trying to figure out how do you actually start to build that and what's under that. And it's complicated, right? Because as soon as you take on that challenge, you know you can take increments of it, only little increments of it at a time to kind of start to build on. Uh, so right now we're doing some work where we're actually thinking about this issue of how do you bring AI understanding of actually dialogues you're having with people and then actually pair what's happening, what AI can do, with folks who actually live the context to actually then say, let's figure out what the coding should be in interpreting something, right? So this marriage between AI and human intelligence is something we really need to hold on to. Yeah, so just to, again, just actually, it's a very nice, we didn't rehearse it, but it's actually <laughs> a very nice counterpoint. So, so kind of the meta point I want to make is, again, is essentially, and you know, we reflect, and in particular, I reflect a lot about this being, you know, teaching computer science is that kind of there is this kind of spirit especially in computer science circles of like i would say techno optimism which says you know technology is the only thing that will save us essentially and you know that's you, that's why you always need more technology and also technological determinism which says that you know there's only one path uh, that technology can progress on and we should just not stand in the way of it because you know we are you are in in the way of uh, of the bad thing and you know what Cesar just says suggests that actually that's not really true Yes, I am a techno-optimism as I think technology can and hopefully will uh, make the world better. But there are choices that we make. Mm -hmm. How we use technology, what problems we tackle that determine if this will be a positive or negative change. So essentially, as you articulated, like with social media, maybe initially, actually, it was supposed to be a tool for dialogue, for having talking to your friends. But what it became exactly is essentially this you know, shouting match of who can get more viral news. So, and again, this didn't happen by accident. There are certain incentives at work here. And someone made these choices, and it's a good question and you know, something that we need to think very deeply, who made this, uh, uh, these choices and why, and why is it okay to make these choices? But this is something that we really, really need to deeply uh, reflect on if we want to kind of make, you really use technology for, to make the world a better place. Good, very good. Well, actually, I'm, so I, I just pick on, up on that. Um, in some, so in addition to, to, to studying technology and elections, I'm also a political historian, and one of the things that it just strikes me in, in terms of on what Alexander was saying, is that I'm kind of surprised, that we're surprised, <laughs> that um, new technologies would be used to tribalize, to yeah. lead to performativism, um, et cetera. In the 19th century, if you were to look at the press landscape back then, you had Democratic papers and Republican papers. And they all basically, you know, two tribes talking within a bubble, not not talking across. Um, the New York Times was was unique in deciding that they were going to print all the news that 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 fits or that, that fit their print or something like that. Um, so um, you know th there there are certain aspects of human I don't want to say nature, but of human existence um, in politics and society and commerce and the rest that don't go away because of technology and. Um, you know, at MIT, we try to, you know, we try to make sure we remind people of that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, in all the, all the fields that we're talking about, we still have to come up against the fact that um, the technology hasn't changed human nature, human desires, incentives, those sorts of things that, that we've been facing for a long, long time. There are some ways that you can tackle this yeah. on the data side, you know, when you, when you think about how you're learning. So at least in the healthcare space, one of the things you can do is make sure that you have a representative sample that you're recruiting. You can make sure that you don't just look at the electronic healthcare record because maybe if you're a female patient, you're a victim of medical gaslighting. Your doctor didn't note down all of the things you actually said when you were there. You can ask them uh, symptomatic questions as part of an app. Um, one of the things that I learned when I was collaborating uh, with people at uh, Verily and Google Brain across the street is you don't want to look at what people put in their social media posts or um, 
uh, you know, it, Facebook, anything, uh, Twitter, because those are very performative, but people will Google things, they will not ask their doctor. So if you have access to some data that maybe is a better proxy for how people are feeling, that's also a way you can try to break down these uh, performances or these very tribal identities. I mean, uh, let me build on that maybe a little bit, uh, something you all said. So what can we do to, to steer these technologies in a better direction? Uh, and social media is something I think we keep picking on. Uh, <laughs> so it started from a very good promise, but uh, you know, led to a lot of unintended consequences. And this is maybe because of you know, uh, uh, different stakeholders uh, having different objectives uh, and you know these objectives coming together perhaps not in the right way when you're thinking about the impact of this technology on the society. So um, how can we tackle this? Would incremental measures uh, be sufficient or do we need something more drastic? Do we need things on the technology side, uh, regulation side? How should we approach these problems? I know it's a hard question, but maybe <laughs> we'll just try to tackle it with this group. So we are going to go. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, so 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 I, I can start because you know I and also Asu, by the way, think about this a lot. And essentially, like I think I wouldn't and it's not clear to me if it's incremental or like a revolution, but I think we really it's very important for us actually as academics in particular to change the way we talk about technology to the public and to our students as well. So in particular, we really should always like this, you know, societal impacts and aspects should not be something an add-on saying, oh, we developed this cool technology and you know, somewhere down the road, like, oh, and also this technology impacts humans. Like this is something that has to be integrated saying that this technology, like you build technology because it was supposed to be used. And used by whom? By humans. And then kind of going back to what Charles says, you know, need to realize, you know, how humans, you know, what is human nature, human existence? And kind of really having this integrated thinking is very important and again, I am a computer scientist. I don't have a very refined understanding of human nature. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I would like to talk to someone who does uh, and kind of having this, you know, uh, yeah, well, we are called nerd for, nerds for a reason. <laughs> uh, but essentially, like, uh, you know, but then the question is, like, you know, there are people on this campus that know that and that are wonderful conversation partners to discuss and together bring this kind of, you know, this, this new view to, to, again, to our students and to the public, right? So, and this is not really happening. Like, to be honest, I think the you know, universities are not playing visible enough role in talking about technology. All of this is, for better or worse, and I think worse, kind of narrative is driven by this, you know, billionaires who are viewed as the, you know, as the geniuses and they know the best. And again, they are very capable people that did something that they should be respected for, but doesn't mean that they know everything and that they know the right answers. So kind of being, providing this counterpoint is, is one thing that we should be doing. The other one is education, right? And that's what we do at this institution. We do research, but we also do education. And again, providing our students who will be the leaders of tomorrow with this nuanced understanding that, oh no, it's just, well, technology is good no matter what, or like if you can build a piece of, you know, of technology, you should do it. No, we should kind of have them realize how difficult it is. What are the things to take in mind? And we should not tell them what to do, but they should be equipped to see the consequences and the kind of implications of the action. So I think that's a big mission for MIT that you know, we hope to fulfill. I was, uh, I was just thinking about uh, the way students enter MIT uh, right now, uh, really hopeful. And sometimes they don't leave that way. Right? This is, I think, part of the point of what you're saying, right? They're, they're not as hopeful. And I think this is part of what we have to do. We have to find a way to both instill that respect for and understanding of the human, human condition and the impact and their own responsibility for what they're doing or what, what they're trying to develop and what it means to actually do something that may have an impact on people, uh, but to also do it in a way that instills hope and promise that something can be done, right? And that's a huge fight in the world right now because there's a, there's a lot of despair, a lot of sense of, you know, we can do these things and yeah, I can do them, but I can go over here and make money off of it, or I can do this. I don't know how to solve this larger problem that I'm working on. Uh, and everything doesn't have to scale. I think this is one of our biggest problems. We, you know, in our education, sometimes as students think, I've got to solve the big problem, right? I, and whatever I do has to scale. And I, and, we need, I think, folks to understand that even these incremental changes, if they're designed in the right way and really embedded in supporting folks on the ground that you're really trying to have an impact on, uh, will make a difference, right? Uh, I think that's where we, 
that's what we're struggling with, is how to keep that hope alive uh, and get you know, students from moving away from thinking that I've got to solve all the problems in the world. Making a better world doesn't mean you make the world better by yourself. It means the thing that you're doing is embedded in a set of principles and a way of looking at the world and a way of having impact that actually leaves everyone better off. At whatever scale you do that at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. So maybe uh, 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 something that Alexander mentioned we think about a lot um, uh, in computer science is sort of AI and its implications, and in particular, the inequalities that sort of comes uh, because of this new, very promising technology, but it's so important to think about those. So the one aspect, for instance, uh, that I'd like to ask our panel is that with sort of AI has come a much greater economic concentration uh, with companies such as you know, Alphabet and Amazon and Apple, Facebook, a handful uh, of companies um, accounting for a much greater fraction of the national income. Or actually, if you're thinking about the AI technology, it's a huge uh, power in terms of data, compute, or you know, uh, all the possibilities, uh, all the access they have to this technology. So, is this type, what do you think about this concentration? I mean, from the uh, viewpoint of technology development, is it problematic? Um, is it inevitable because of the network nature of uh, products and data? Is there anything we can do about it? <laughs> I, I have so, so, uh, a lot of thoughts on this. Actually, one of the things we're working on right now in our center is this notion of building what we call data trust. And this is a, uh, a supportive way to let people whose actually data is being used for something to actually build their own cooperative trust to actually decide how that data gets used, when, and under what conditions. I think there are things we can do about it, but it really means rethinking the system completely, right? It's really saying that you, know, you don't get your wealth by just aggregating across people and taking. It's an extractive practice, right? Wealth in this country was built on extractive practices. We can't solve this problem by continuing to do extractive practices, which means now we have to build more collaborative and cooperative practices. Mm -hmm. We don't do that very well, right? So it shouldn't be a surprise that that's what our technology has led us to. Uh, there are lots of lessons we can learn both in this country and from other places in the world on how to build more collaborative strategies and structures and technologies you know, uh, that can actually do, help us do something much more collaboratively and much more collective uh, in that way. So the, the, the benefit, not only to the immediate thing that technology gives you, but the benefit also from the capital value of that can be distributed in relationship to you know, the people who have helped contribute to that. And that means contributing both the little piece of information you add to that to actually to the design that made the system work. All of that is part of the value making proposition. And if we can't disrupt uh, the way we do that now uh, and everything else and stop having it be so extractive, uh, we'll continue in the same place. Yes, so just, just to add, so just to answer your, your question, again, Caesar is very nicely meshing with what I'm about to say, is that it is an inevitable in the current uh, in the current environment, meaning given what are the incentives, what is like this okay to just extract everyone's data, harvest it? Right. Like, yes, you would be like crazy not to do it, what these companies do, because they are just, they have fiduciary responsibility, they stay uh, like shareholders, and they are just doing this. They are just using all the uh, tools that are available to them to maximize we uh, wealth and the network effects are at play, and all of that is true. So, is that a good thing? I don't think so, you know, uh, at least until I will have my Facebook, you know, Facebook uh, stock. Uh, I am, I would be uh, strongly against it. I'm kidding, of course. Uh, uh, so essentially, I think this is, this is bad. And we do understand that. Like, we don't need AI to understand that. Like, you know, we had the railroad, uh, railroad or oil kind of monopolies. We realized, no, that's not good. You know, even though it arise naturally because it was nice to amass kind of, you know, and serialize uh, production and kind of, and, and getting this, we realized, no, no, this is bad. That's why we have antitrust role. Ro do you realize that yes, the dynamics of economy can lead to this kind of big, you know, uh, big uh, players, but like that's not a good thing and we have a mechanism for this. Somehow, this mechanism does not seem to trigger for any of what's happening now. And I think the reason for that is, that I don't think people really realize 
what's going on. Like kind of, yeah, we might mm -hmm. realize as you know, professors at MIT, but the average public, they don't really realize, for instance, that it's not only about the capitalization of like $1 trillion or something. It's about the power that these companies have. Facebook could decide all the elections by just doing nothing more than just nudges about reminding people to go to vote and telling them where is the, the closest thing. Of course, doing this to the right population of people. Like they could decide all the, our elections. Like people don't realize that. They don't appreciate that. And I think that's the kind of awareness that needs to be built before there will be political, like well-intentioned political will to really change something here. And again, get this mechanism, me mechanism in place. Well, I, I, <laughs> I was looking. <laughs> well, I was going to say when, when, some, when, when a computer scientist says that, that, that Facebook could determine the outcome of the election, <laughs> them's fighting words uh, <laughs> to a political scientist. Uh, but actually, what, what, what I wanted to what, where I wanted to dig into though was um, to challenge the premise a little bit, or at least suggest that many of the problems, at least again in the political realm, um, exist with and without the concentration of great wealth and computing power mm -hmm. that, that we observe. Mm -hmm. Um, so, for instance, I mean, it, it's maybe maybe not a surprise um, to people in this room, but there are companies, many, many companies um, around now that have a list of every American in um, the United States and your voting history and about um, 500 to 2,000 variables about you. And they've modeled everything um, to try to figure out all sorts of things about you, ranging from um, the probability that um, my favorite one, the probability that you're a gay hunter to um, the probability that you're um, a MAGA supporter. And, um, and because AI at some level is so simple to do if you have the data, and the data now are free, essentially, um, that um, the issue with some of this manipulation is not concentration, but rather, in some, many ways, the horse is out of the barn. Um, and um, that, especially in the United States, with weak antitrust laws, but also a big, you know, a big forum given to people under the umbrella of freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to, um, to regulate in that, that environment. Um, and so um, that's kind of the scary side. The not so scary side, and this is kind of the, you know, this is the other side that I think that we have to, that we have to wrestle with. The fact that I know so much about somebody whose door I'm knocking on means that I can employ um, bright-eyed MIT students to go door knocking, and I can give them a street list such that I know that every person that they're going to talk to will want to hear what they have to say. Now, if you're an old guy like me um, and used to 30, 40 years ago, have a street list and go door to door, you know how demoralizing it is to have it slammed in your face 90% of the time. So I think that, you know, the, the, so thing number one, I think, you know, there's concentration of economic wealth, but there's decentralization of, of the data. That decentralization of the data has all sorts of opportunities, you know, gives you, again, all sorts of opportunities to use it to engage people, um, but also to do that nudging <laughs> that you were talking about. Um, and it's, you know, it, it's, well, anyway, um, I'll stop there. I want to say something about that. But I want to let you go first, please. I, I wanted to say, so when we say that, you know, the data is free and the data is decentralized, it's like free and decentralized for whom? Mm -hmm. So let's think about health data, which is held primarily at hospitals right now. They have all of your electronic health care records. They can de-identify those records using HIPAA standards, and then they can sell that for lots of money, you may have heard, to large companies. Now, I, as an academic researcher, can request that they give me the same data, but I don't have millions or billions of dollars to give the hospital. They have no incentive to share it with me. And in fact, it's very difficult for researchers in machine learning and health to get access to the same size and diversity of data sets that people just across the street who work in industry have access to, which is something they remind me of frequently. <laughs> we have all the data, why are you still in academia? Yeah. Um, <laughs> And that's really dangerous because it means that we could be in the position that a lot of speech researchers are right now, where all of the large speech data sets that are used to train and evaluate these models that can uh, detect human speech, those are held at companies. They're held privately, 
And there aren't the same kinds of data repositories that academic researchers have access to or have created at that scale, which means we are at a huge competitive disadvantage in training those researchers and auditing those systems okay. mm -hmm. to make sure that they work well for everyone. Mm -hmm. And do we want that for health? Maybe not. Mm. Very good. Uh, not to pick a fight. <laughs> <laughs> let's go. Yeah, let's go. Actually, it's not, it's not picking a fight, but I, I think what you said is true, but, I th but also the, there are choices we make mm -hmm. that got us to this place. I want to name two. One was the Telecommunication Act of 1996, mm -hmm. right? Which actually basically deregulated everything about how information transfers happen, right? right? And it did it from a point where there was a public obligation, mm -hmm. and it took the public obligation away. Right. And as soon as it did that, it took away any lever that was there to do something different. And that was a choice that was made. So I, I think there are opportunities, but we don't necessarily make the choice all the time that allows us to do that. The other one that I, I personally love is that when Obama first ran, one of the things that was beautiful about his campaign is the, the breadth of the kinds of people he really pulled into his campaign. And he used a lot of the sophisticated technology to do it. My hope, and when he got into office, they set up this commission to look at expanding democracy in America and in public civic engagement. And I said, the best thing he could do is turn over that list mm -hmm. to an organization that really wanted to build more civic capacity in America and not keep it in the Democratic Party, mm -hmm. right? Because he had broken through a lot. And if he just said, OK, this isn't in about politics. This is about building more connections among people in this country it would have been a game changer. So I think there's a way in which we have these opportunities all the time, but we fall into the same kinds of things that, we, you know, that we're going to value or the rubrics that we're going to use for making the decisions. And I think we just need something different to shake us up. Yeah, so anyway, I'm not really fighting with you. <laughs> I just wanted to very quickly just say, so I agree with you that, well, again, I agree and disagree, but like there is access to data. There is data that has this very, very like insane precision about you. Yeah. That's by the way, the business what Facebook really is in, is gathering this data and selling it to normally the advertisers, although the Cambridge Analytica show that some of these advertisers are not really advertisers or, or advertisers <laughs> of a different kind of fa fare. And by the way, if you go outside of the US, you know, they all use Facebook and they just are like the politicians are using Facebook exactly to weaponize it in this way that, you know, I know who my audience is. But again, this is one thing is knowledge about the people, that is the ability to target them and get to them. Mm -hmm. And yes, you can have the stu MIT students to go and knock on the door, but in this time, you know, Facebook can do the same to these hundreds of thousands of millions of people in the US that not only you know are the good recipients for your message, but actually will get this message from Facebook. So that's the other part that, again, you need to pay Facebook to deliver this to them, and that gives them some power. So I just wanted to clarify that. Right, right. Although, I mean, in that case, I mean, you know, this is a complicated thing. I mean, Facebook has access to one part of that data set that the politicians don't have, which is young people, oftentimes. And actually, I think a more ethnically and racially diverse group of folks than the politicians have that I was talking about, uh, talking about earlier. Um, and so in this sense, this is where kind of the, this commercial divide that, that you were talking about is really important. If we can get Facebook's data into the public, yep. I mean, and some ironically enough, yep. nothing, I mean, this is a, probably a stupid idea, but there's something to be said for an elements of like Facebook's data, if you were to able to productively engage yep. the people that they can engage that the people I work with can't, mm -hmm. then you, know, you would be able to get them to do you know, you know, physical things in politics rather than just rail at each other, right? Because that's, that, that's the problem with Facebook is that they can rile up people. What we don't know is that do they then go out and vote or do they just, yeah. you know, yell at each other and kind of create an environment in which it's kind of everything's poison. Yeah. I'm sure that for mere $100 million, they will work with you to, do, to, to change all of that. <laughs> I have my NSF proposal. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, I would like to maybe stay on the topic for a little bit because of what Marzia started saying, like the impact of this concentration also on academic work, uh, and especially ML, uh, machine learning, AI researchers. Uh, the fact that you know access to data, access to compute, access to being able to train very large models is limited. So do you want to maybe add a few words on that? Uh, yes, you, you may not realize, depending on you know, uh, your, your, uh, your favorite area of reading or, or research or interest, 
Um, the AI academic space is actually reasonably cozy with industry. They fund our students. Five of my graduate students are doing industry uh, internships this summer, and they will make double their uh, annual stipend in these, in these three months that they're working for the companies. Um, they hire a lot of our students. Uh, they give faculty fellowships to support our research. And the problem is, I think, that as uh, academic researchers, um, we can see that in industry, there's a lot more firepower available, right? And we are often restricted in certain ways that are, I think, good. But it means that often we, we can't compete in the same way. So if Google has access to 100,000 GPUs, they are going to train a better language model than I can. That's just how it works. If they can also buy all of the healthcare records from every hospital in the Boston area, they're going to use those GPUs to model health data better than I can. Uh, and so I think this kind of difference in capacity and resources uh, can lead to a great stratification. And again, I think as academic researchers, we have to really push to say, there's a certain way that we want to work with industry. And I think you can see this gap in some fields even. So uh, you know, again, in the, the speech, natural language processing through, through audio community, there really has been this huge loss of the capacity to compete in an academic space, which is not something you want. We hear all these articles coming out now about how why do you know Siri and Alexa and all these assistants mm. not work well for some people, or they're, they're doing kind of odd things that we wouldn't want them to? Well, we don't really have the same capacity to engage in an academic space. But if you look at the vision space, for example, most of the vision data sets that are gathered, even by our academic colleagues that work in an industrial research center, so they work for Microsoft Research or Google Research, those get released. They get released publicly or they get released so that you can have access to them as long as you pass some certification check. It's a different culture. Yeah. And because the culture is different, the expectation is different, then they are engaging with us as academic researchers differently. And we're at this horrible crossroads in health right now where we're really trying to speak out and say, you need to make health data uh, once de-identified, available to academic researchers in the same way that you are doing to industry. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's something that we're fighting really hard to try to achieve. Very good. Yes. Very good. I know you have much to add, but in the interest of yeah. <laughs> I, I can see him cringing. Uh, so the other uh, aspect of unequal uh, AI that I would like to bring in is the increasing concern that uh, AI, in particular technologies, are creating various burdens on already uh, disadvantaged minority groups. And this is because of economic inequality that I've mentioned before, but also these uh, a lot of the biases uh, that come from data sets or other kinds of uh, mechanisms and creep into various AI applications. So my question, and I know uh, several of you think about this quite a bit, so, so what can be done to create equal opportunities to all groups and uh, be able to tackle with these biases? Uh, so a lot of the work that my group does now is actually try to figure out uh, good ways to make machine learning more healthy, meaning it works well, it works robustly and fairly on a diverse group of people. There are things you can do from how you define your problem how you curate your data. So uh, as an example, if you say, I'm going to remove any data point that has more than 10% of this variable missing, well, you might miss some people who work a blue collar job and they can't come in at specific times and so their data is missing at those points in time. Um, you can also address the way that you design the algorithm itself. There are some machine learning techniques that are based on finding patterns and averages and so they exclude or remove any data that is an outlier. Who do you think is an outlier in health data sets? It's minority patients. We ran several analyses where if you run these state-of-the-art techniques that everybody's using in machine learning, all of the black patients' influence goes to zero. All of it. it it's crazy. And we wouldn't have figured this out. We didn't know why it was, it was doing so poorly until we looked at the inner workings of these techniques. And so these assumptions that we make that when we observe data in nature, you know, it should go to an average, and if anything is too different, then it's an outlier, maybe we should trim it or not be able to predict on it. That doesn't work for human settings, or we aren't comfortable with saying, this model will only work on this kind of person, 
Everybody else has to get a different kind of service or a different um, level of care. Uh, there's also some very interesting questions about how you deploy models. Let's say I train the best model that I can. It does you know, very, very well. We have found that tiny differences, truly tiny differences in how you give the recommendations of the model to the doctor change dramatically whether they listen to it or not. Mm -hmm. And these are things that we don't think about often as machine learning researchers. We train these great models that work really well and we think about the biases and we hand them off to our collaborators. And this tiny difference in exactly the text that you put the recommendation in could have this huge difference in whether a clinician listens or doesn't listen. And so there's this entire pipeline that you can address. You just have to think very carefully about it. Yeah, so just to uh, add on this, it's like, yeah, so the question is like, yeah, how do we fix it more globally? So, and I think that different parts of our society have different role to play. So we as researchers, we are just pointing out, look, this is a problem, like Marzia said, this and this and this. But it, Marzia cannot go, you know, as amazing as she is, to go to every <laughs> hospital and fix, okay, it's your true. model. <laughs> She's trying, but, uh, <laughs> but even she, uh, she cannot, cannot do that. So there has to be some incentive, uh, a kind of structural incentive there for these institutions and this industry to think about this first. And again, like we, I don't want to say that in lending we fix it before AI because there is a lot of problems there, but at least we realize there is a problem. And we try to put some legislation, some regulations to essentially, not that again, no, no, like there is not that like, you know, the judges are going around and checking the, you know, how the lending is done, but at least there is some expectation, there's a law that makes sure, okay, if you are doing lending, well, you are supposed to uphold these principles. And if we catch you not doing that, well, you, you will be punished. So again, and this is what builds the incentive for the industry to think about it, even if naturally they wouldn't think about it because maybe this, you know, this would be just like 5% of the clients and they want to focus on the 95% of them. So, so this is kind of something that, you know, uh, like this is the change that actually can scale up. Like yeah, we indicate problems and then there is a societal discussion and consensus and kind of some policy that implements, uh, implements that. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Well, uh, I'd like to maybe uh, have a, the final question. I think, uh, I hope we were able to uh, persuade uh, uh, our audience that these are questions like technology all the way to better deployment for society are things uh, we're deeply thinking about from computer science all the way to SHAS. So I'd like to ask maybe uh, uh, our panel, can MIT play a leadership role here in encouraging the development of better and socially more beneficial technologies? Uh, what is our responsibility in your view to US public as well as the world uh, in terms of the future of digital technologies and AI? Well, if we don't do it, then who will do it? Like, like, no, like seriously, like, like, like this, is, this is the role, like I think that MIT in particular was created to, to play this role, yes? Like essentially like, yes, we understand the technology very deeply, but you know, hopefully working with you know, our humanities colleagues and so on, we can really like forge this vision and try to articulate how the future should look like and in particular, you know, uh, one thing that, okay, so it's one thing is to define what this vision is. The other thing is how we, do we propagate it further? And again, education is something that you know, I and I think my colleagues believe a lot. It's educating our students, but also educating the public. You know, there are ways of kind of also, and we do provide as MIT con educational content to the rest of the society, but also is the other role, which again goes into policy making. Something, by the way, that in computer science, we didn't really think about policy making because, you know, that's the kind of the thing that other people are doing, you know, sorry. <laughs> 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 sorry, Charles. But like we realized, okay, maybe, you know, we should step up in that space as well. Again, not as someone who tries to lobby for a particular uh, solution or not. Now, that's not our role, but as a convener who kind of brings together all the stakeholders and actually all the stakeholders, make sure they're represented, and also a sounding board saying, okay, you want to do this with technology. Well, this is not really possible with this technology, but this could be possible with this technology. And kind of being the sounding board of feasibility of solutions from the technological point of view, well, we do really understand this technology. We build this technology. Actually, we might learn from these conversations what technology we should build. So I think this is a huge and very exciting role for MIT to play. Yeah, and in, that's a speech that almost could have been made by, uh, by a faculty member in my, in my school. I mean, I, I think that, and you know, I, so to, to maybe give a, a different spin, but a, ver, a very similar message. Um, you know, there is a reason why at MIT on the education side that our general education, and you all know this, um, many of y'all um, have, have degrees from this place, our general education is half science and half not science. And there's a reason for that. And that you know, MIT's 
um, mission is not simply to apply technology, to, but to serve the nation and the world through the application of that te technology. And from the founding, ever since we were over in the back bay, um, the, the, you know, the starting point has been what are societal needs. I think the challenge at MIT always is that we attract people who, um, I have to say, as a, as a non-technologist, but somebody who loves hanging out with technologists, we attract people who oftentimes lead with the te technology, and we as faculty um, you know, have the obligation to engage all of our students on kind of the soft and the hard skills, um, to, to use a kind of hackneyed um, expression. Um, and that's a constant struggle that we engage with here at MIT, but I think that in the current age, with so many of these new issues bumping up against societal inequalities and problems, it's right in your face the importance um, of students being dual literate mm -hmm. and for faculty being um, in partnership with each other and working on these projects, um, which you know, all of us you know, <laughs> on the stage um, have, have done in various ways. Very cool. So, yeah. I, I have a funny story to tell about <laughs> how, you know, uh, being uh, MIT is already making a difference. So uh, there is a, a person who is a, a CEO at a, at a large tech company who shall remain unnamed. And um, I had given a talk while I was a professor for a couple of years at University of Toronto um, about how data should be more open in the healthcare space and there should be more regulation and, you know, uh, the same thing that I've, I've talked to you all about. Um, I think this person uh, was, uh, you know, uh, in the panel discussion and then um, had not heard my talk, so didn't associate me with, uh, like, my face with my name. Um, and my name it ha is pronounced and has been pronounced many different ways. And so, like, heard one pronunciation of my name and really said, like, this is a silly idea. Whatever person proposed this is just ridiculous. You know, who would propose this? I gave this talk two months ago. Same talk, same talk. And this person said, MIT people have great ideas. So, <laughs> so I will tell you, <laughs> we can make a difference. It was the same content, but it, it felt, it was received differently. Yes. I, I think the one thing I want to add to this is that I think part of our ability to lead on these issues in the world is to actually tackle the way they are represented inside the institution itself. That. Uh, it's kind of like you can't lead where you're not willing to actually have your own practice embedded in it. And uh, there are a lot of things that we've talked about today that exist even with inside of this institution. Not the same as they exist in the world, but it does exist. The disparities exist, uh, people who feel like they're not part of things, decision-making processes. Can we, as, you know, as an organization, also think about how do we apply what we want the world to do Mm -hmm. to ourselves. And we actually have you know, one project that we're starting out now, which is building this social dialogue platform that, uh, interesting enough, we're actually going to be starting to develop that and use that inside of MIT to actually match up uh, what people's experiences are being in MIT with the new value statements that's, that's just been released. And, uh, and we have a really interesting social dialogue platform that uses a lot of kind of natural language processing, but also uh, knowledge that actually happens with inside of units uh, to actually extract meaning making from that. Uh, and so this, we, we call it real talk at MIT, but uh, we're piloting it now over at Aero Astro and Sloan. Okay. And so there's, there's a possibility to do that, to take what we think is better for the world and make it better for us also. Great. Excellent. So I'd like to now maybe welcome questions from the audience uh, for our panel. Uh, I have one in front of me, but I'd like to see if maybe anyone would like to pick up. Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're talking about the extractive nature and the financialization of most of our society. You were talking about the financialization and the extractive nature of our society. And what can we do to be more inclusive and such that maybe every individual owns the data or gets somehow gets money. You get the data they provide provides them with revenue. So, so how do you change the incentive structure mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to enable that to happen? So uh, there, there are a couple of parts to that question. I, I want to 
answer the human part for a little bit, and maybe others can answer the technology part, and, but they go together. Part of the human problem is people realizing they actually have something of value. Mm -hmm. Basically, what we've done in our society for the general public is told them they don't know anything. Mm -hmm. And they need to listen to other people. They don't have anything to offer, and it's not of value. So that's one of the first things we have to do is get people to realize, actually, your experience, what you have to offer, is of value, mm -hmm. right? It is something that has value. And then there are lots of different technologies. If we had that mindset and wanted to actually make that happen, that we could use from blockchain to other kinds of things that actually make, would make it possible. Yes, yeah, so just add to it, and again, Caesar is always compliments what I want to say as well. It's like the kind of funny thing is so so definitely like yeah, there's this whole notion that you know Facebook is and always will be free, and again, just people realize it's not really free. There is something right. you pay because you have something of value. Having said that, the tricky technical question is that we actually don't know how to put price on the data, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Meaning yes, like because everything I have to well not everything but most of what I have for Facebook to uh, to, to offer well, they can get it from my friends. Right, so in term, like if I just ask about the effect of me taking away my data uh, versus uh, staying here, it will actually be a minuscule effect. But we do realize that you know collectively, if we took all of our data from you know from the platform, well, clearly they would, the, the whole model would be completely you know completely dead, dead in the water. So figuring out this technical question and us actually and uh, you know and some uh, people in economics department work on this question is like how do you actually put value? on data is a technical question. But yeah, hey, we are at MIT. We are thinking about hard questions like that. Yeah. And this is part of the solution. But I really love the point you make, because there is, we can come up with the answer, technical answer. But then someone like the, the society has to realize, OK, there is value. Like, I actually should ask even. Uh, before uh, taking an action that like should realize Facebook, like, hey, what's happening to my data? Why are you taking it? And, and so on and so on. And I think that's a very important change yeah. uh, in perspective. And that data that Facebook has is represents one thing of value, but I think actually people have a more knowledge that actually has more value, and it's in their narrative constructions of their life. Mm -hmm. Facebook doesn't know how to capture that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They don't have a mechanism for doing that. It's actually kind of, in the social dialogue work, part of what we're trying to get at is, how do you let people actually tell their stories and narratives about their experience in the world, and then let them own where that goes, right? Because that's more rich than any data point, yeah. right, that you can get. But just to add one more thing, I should be talking as the moderator, but indeed this is a topic we're very interested in and uh, have some projects on how to properly design data markets that can actually compensate users in the right way yeah. so that some of this free sort of uh, extraction of uh, value from individuals actually is properly compensated within the technologies that we're talking about. So, All thank you so much for these good thoughts. Um, it seems that in many cases, the greatest obstacles to greater dissemination, faster dissemination of new technologies and, and accessibility of them is the regulations themselves. Uh, I think of HIV drugs back in the 1990s. Mm. The FDA's regulations kept those from being more widely available more quickly. If I think of drones today, it's the FAA's regulations that are keeping them from being more widely adopted. Uh, Regulatory agencies are, are inherently risk averse, more so, more so, I dare say, than society overall. In, in each of your fields, what would you say is the lowest hanging fruit of a regulation which, if relaxed or eliminated, could most accelerate the adoption of a new technology? Thank you. Mm, really great question. Well, you know, I work in machine learning. There is very little, if any, regulation there. So it's completely like, you know, p pedal to the, <laughs> to the floor yeah. kind of yeah. situation. <laughs> uh, so I would like some breaks. And by the way, there is a tricky thing about innovation. So you are right that in some uh, case, like the question is in what innovation is. Yes, And then just saying whatever the big companies are doing, that's one kind of innovation. But like in some ways, again, just uh, Marzia got it right. It's the access to data. Like actually you need regulations about access to data to enable broader set of people, like mm -hmm. meaning academics, to really innovate. Right. So in some ways, and by the way, I see it also in my field, like Google, Facebook, they are using the kind of monopoly on data to essentially say, yeah, if I want to join f Facebook to work on this, they say, yeah, welcome. Come, here is a lot of money and yeah. all data in the world. But if you want to st like stay outside, then sorry. But like the big, and this is one thing that the big corporations understand, they're not good at innovating. 
You know, that's why they are keep buying startups because that's the only way for them to really innovate. Like, and again, maybe this goes to more of the IBM era. It's like essentially the companies realize that innovation within a big corp uh, corporation is difficult because it's very difficult to kill the product. Right, so you someone starts something with some political capital, and it's just like not delivering, but it's very hard to pull the plug for political reasons. So this is why. So in some ways, if we just the only the only organization that can innovate are big companies, then we actually are not innovating enough, mm -hmm. right? And you no, know, I can go more into it, but I guess we are running out of time. Yes, yeah. maybe one last question. Uh, yes, um, okay. the gentleman there was talking about we we teach humanities and also science. Mm -hmm. And there is a bridge on that. And I see from all of you kind of a complaint about the system. And, and I'm asking myself is MIT, what kind of a collaborative activity is doing in human rights? What kind of collaborating activity is doing? Because managing all those things are managed by human. We just came from another uh, uh, speakers group and it's human. Human is doing everything. So it's our society who is sick. So what is MIT going to do in order that it's not only technology, but the bridge with society when society meets technology for the yeah. decision maker? No politicians, no Facebook, no Musk, no all those you know, people. It's people who has the power, I guess. And you were mentioning that is the human who is behind all that. What is MIT is going to do about that? Well, again, uh, I think the, uh, this is a great conversation that like, you know, what is the role of universities in particular places like MIT in, in all of that? So I think our first step is to articulate the vision, like how the, the, the different world w w would look like and what is not happening currently. And then we not only have to, you know, uh, articulate it again in, in a bunch of papers and, you know, be all mighty impressed with each other that like how smart we are. We actually have to use this uh, platform of MIT to essentially say that to the world, right? So we are already doing, and I can tell you, like, you know, there are things like I'm involved in AI policy forum, like College of Computing actually cares about it a lot. You know, also Shaz, uh, you know, is, is, and I hope will continue to be a great partner in this endeavor. It's exactly to formulate the vision educate our students so they understand it. But again, really talk to the policymakers about this and saying, well, this something is going bad. And then talk to the society, like showing them what is bad. Because again, we have to take, we have a great panel over here, but you know, we are not all of the society. So the question is like, how can we have events where we highlight this problem and we articulate the vision? So this is what I think definitely the role of, of us is. And then I hope definitely in the long term, our students will change the world, they always do. But you know, but essentially, there is also a part that you know the rest of the world has to play here. So we just need to play our part. Yeah. Very quickly, I don't know what MIT. I have ideas about what MIT should do, but I'm a faculty member. We're faculty members, and th this is one of the things I note. I run. I, I, I have two serious interfaces with Washington D.C. Uh, in policy making. One is I talk to election officials all the time. Secondly, I run MIT's um, internship program in Washington D.C. The thing, what, the thing that impresses me a lot is that when I need help from a f faculty colleague in getting a student an, an internship, in getting somebody to talk about a policy area, they come. And as Caesar was saying, you know, part of MIT doing the right thing is faculty living out that experience. Not every faculty member does it, but my impression, I, I've, I mean, I would be, you know, you would be shocked how many people from MIT are on the U.S. Air, it used to be the U.S. Air shuttle down to, to, to Washington <laughs> on the day after graduation. Um, and that's for a lot of reasons. And so I think part of it is just getting our students humanly connected to this process. Um, that it, it's not just this panel, but a lot of faculty members are dedicated to that. I just want to say it's really heartening to see panel get together from six to shots. And you know, but why has it taken so long and how much longer is it gonna take to reach a critical mass where an interdisciplinary, this collaborative, this collective being together uh, to really do something. And the reason I say this is because 50 years ago, possibly, I embarked on my team, I said I wanted to major in four, six biological and philosophy. And, and then I was like an outlier. I said, why? I, I thought we should be able to have an impact on determining how technology would work. 
Yeah. 50 years ago. And so when I arrived fall of 71, along with Jerry Reisner, I think he was the um, mm. you know, premier at that point. Um, Houston Smith, the only person I knew at the Velocity Department, left for Berkeley. So I said, well, what am I going to do now? I guess I have to learn it on my own. Through, but I want to take architecture. So I ended up, my first course was this guy slipped back. I thought I was at a Harvard class and turned out to be Nick Nebuchadnezzar. There we are mm -hmm. in his building that he thought about. And it's just like it comes full circle. Mm -hmm. So I'm so glad to see this. But talk is one thing, but when are we going to reach the critical mass to really make impact, a difference? To make a better world. Is it five years? Or are we going to have this conversation 50 years? I, I may not be here. Well, I, okay, I, I would just say if we don't, like, I think we will see an actual measurable change in the next couple of years and by, you know, five years for sure. And, you know, why, you know, why now and not earlier? Well, that's a great question. And we can talk about academia and how quickly it moves about things. <laughs> but like, so the good thing is, I like this analogy, is like, this is like an academia and particularly MIT is a little bit like an oil tanker. Like it, you know, you think there's something important that it's need to realign and you just push, push, push and nothing happens. And then suddenly, like, once it starts moving, it's moving there. So I think we are in this movement phase. Yep. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of really, like, essentially everything, again, like, we don't talk to each other that much across different schools. But, like, now when I talk to my colleagues in, in different schools, like, they are speaking my language in some ways. Like, there is, so it's not just, like, me or Asu or Marzi or, you know, one of us just having this vision. This is really coming together. Like, it almost feels that, like, the draft is lifting. So, yes, I wish we did it 10 years ago. But 10 years ago, we did not understand how important it is. Only now we see the fires that, you know, that, uh, that emerge. So, well, better late than never, I guess. Yeah. And, but like, I do think, and again, there is, it's not only just you know, a couple of faculty feeling strongly about this. Like, it's the whole movement also, like putting structures in place, putting different way of forming like college of computing with like shared searches and so on. Like, there is many thinking that MIT, again, M M MIT think about how to solve problems, of how to set up everything. So there is it's really like, you are not working against the wind, but actually wind is blowing you in that direction. So I'm very hopeful about that, but yes, you know, it, I wish we started doing this area. Yeah. And I stopped Facebook four years ago, and I kind of lost track of some of my friends who were still on it. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it was a you know conscious decision about the data loss and, and what they were doing for better or for worse. And I, I need to reevaluate that, but I can't say. So. But the, there is a tide. I think I've been at MIT for 20 years, and the last couple of years has been very different. So I think that we're seeing a change across the campus, and I feel I agree with Alexander that this That's change was good. Exactly. Yes. Well, thank you. On that note, thanks everyone. So, and thank you for the speakers for an excellent discussion. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Very good.